the November 11th edition of the Global News Review. I'm Patrick Ryan. Welcome. And uh, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Breck Walker. Ambassador Dick Bauer is, is off today, but we're also uh, joined today by uh, special guest host, uh, Tim Douglas. Welcome, Tim. And uh, Breck, good to see you. Thanks, Pat. Great to be here. Thank Great you. to have Tim here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let me uh, first introduce uh, Tim, who's on the uh, board of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Uh, he's our uh, pinch hitter today. Uh, Tim Douglas is a native Nashvilleian who serves as regional director of uh, private banking for First Bank. His education included an MA in international economics from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky, along with uh, many other educational scholarly accomplishments. He also uh, has an extensive resume in banking, finance, and building businesses in New York, Japan, and Nashville. Too much to mention here, but you can find out uh, more about Tim in his bio on our program page at tnwac.org. Uh, Tim has been married for over 40 years. He has uh, three married children, and he's proud to say two grandchildren and one on the way. Uh, they live in uh, Seattle, Los Angeles, and Nashville. And uh, Breck, uh, thank you for uh, bringing uh, Tim into the fold here today. Oh, well, great. I'm so glad he's here. And I, I uh, had a couple things to add on his introduction, if you don't mind. I spoke to one of Tim's admirers doing my research and uh, uh, two things. One, Tim is a very proficient player with the bagpipes. I'm sorry he didn't bring him with him today. And uh, <laughs> secondly, and I didn't know this, uh, Tim got uh, the Boulevard Bolt started way back when, which is just a seminal event now in, uh, in Nashville for th uh, Thanksgiving run. So uh, anyway, welcome, Tim. Glad you're here. Well, thanks, Breck, and I am very proud of the Boulevard Bolt and having founded that, and I'm not so proud of my bagpipes, but, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't tell a, a good bagpiper from a bad bag, bagpiper. <laughs> I need to take that up then. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, well, uh, Tim, Tim, we're glad to, uh, to have you here, and uh, I think we're going to uh, jump right into our, uh, our quiz question. Um, uh, Breck, why don't you uh, introduce us to uh, the question of the week? Great. Thanks, Pat. Let me remind everyone that you can receive the 10 WAC What in the World weekly quiz by subscribing to our email list on the 10 website. And today's question, as, uh, as is usual, comes from, the, from, comes from that weekly quiz, and it is a question drawn from the uh, U.S. Institute of uh, Peace. And the question is, Armed conflict in Myanmar's Rakhine state between the Arakan army and the Tatmada, the national army, has escalated sharply in the past two years. This development has been largely eclipsed, however, by the continuing international focus on the human rights crisis of this Muslim minority. And the answers are A, Rohingya, B, Peshmerga, C, Tigray or Tigrayan, and D, Kuta. <laughs> Katupalong. And we'll have the answer at the end of the program. Thanks, Pat. Well done. Thanks, uh, Breck. Um, yeah, we're, we appreciate the uh, work of the U.S. Institute of Peace and are always happy to, uh, to talk with them about uh, things uh, going on in the world. Um, let's uh, look at our topics for today. Normally, Ambassador Bowers is our, uh, our uh, MC for, for the, uh, the lead in here, but I'll I'll take the lead. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the global reaction to President-elect uh, Biden. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, Bolivia, the tumultuous year, and the uh, ups and downs of the presidency uh, in that uh, South American country. And in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, is there a looming civil war? And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Walker on, on that topic. Uh, first, let's uh, talk about uh, the global reaction to uh, President-elect Biden, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the, uh, the President-elect uh, spent Monday talking with uh, uh, health uh, leaders and putting together a, uh, uh, a team for fighting the, uh, the COVID-19 virus in the United States, but then on Tuesday turned to uh, talking with uh, international leaders. And uh, his, uh, his message was that America was back in the world uh, he uh, uh, talked to uh, uh, five leaders in particular about uh, the relationship between the United States uh, and those countries. 
Um, he had been receiving notes of congratulations since being designated as president-elect on Saturday. And uh, 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 then he got on the phone on Tuesday with the leaders of uh, uh, Canada, Germany, the UK, France, and Ireland. And uh, his message was that uh, the United States was back in the game. And he talked uh, specifics with, uh, with each of those leaders. I think the common denominator uh, was talking about uh, COVID-19 and uh, climate challenges. Uh, but obviously from the selection of leaders, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, he, he talked with, his emphasis was on the transatlantic alliance and uh, signaling that uh, he was fully supportive of the relationship with our European allies and our NATO allies. Uh, with uh, Canadian uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, he talked about uh, climate change and COVID and, and the uh, tackling of relations, uh, the challenges and opportunities facing uh, our two countries. The uh, phone call with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was probably a little more interesting because um, uh, President-elect Biden is on the record as uh, putting down a marker with the United Kingdom that if they change the conditions of Brexit, that would uh, make it more difficult for uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland to maintain the open border that the uh, US-UK trade agreement uh, could be um, held up as, as a result. But the two of them uh, talked about climate change. Uh, um, Prime Minister Johnson uh, invited the president to the COVID um, conference that's gonna be held in Edinburgh next year, late next year. And uh, they, uh, they seem to have had a, a warm uh, conversation. Uh, Vice, uh, excuse me, President-elect Biden also talked with French President Emmanuel Macron for about 10 minutes on Tuesday and said they would work together on climate, health, and the fight against terrorism. Uh, Pres uh, Vice President-elect Biden conveyed his interest in reinvigorating the bilateral and transatlantic ties, including through NATO and the EU. And uh, uh, they also expressed their readiness to work together on global challenges such as uh, security and development in Africa, the conflict in U Ukraine and Syria, and the Iranian nuclear program. France, uh, obviously, as one of the partners to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the uh, so-called Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, our European allies are, and uh, Russia and China remain in the deal. The United States uh, withdrew during the, the Trump administration. So that's something that will be uh, on the diplomatic uh, table coming, uh, coming up. Uh, President-elect uh, Biden also spoke with uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, he expressed uh, uh, desires to continue to work closely with our allies uh, in, in Germany. And uh, they both acknowledged uh, transatlantic cooperation as a priority. Uh, interestingly, uh, not generally among the first calls that a, a new president-elect would make, but uh, Biden as uh, a uh, Irish American may have wanted to include this on the first day. He spoke with the prime minister of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, uh, also known as the Tausich. That's the uh, title of the prime minister, uh, Michael Martin, uh, reaffirmed the uh, president elect's uh, commitment to restoring uh, relations between the US and the EU, as well as support for the Good Friday Agreement uh, which uh, was the agreement that uh, ended the, uh, the conflict between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republican Arm Army over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, they wanted to discuss the uh, uh, not returning to a border between the Northern Ireland uh, uh, territory of the UK and uh, the Republic of Ireland. Um, and uh, uh, they also signaled that uh, uh, Biden was uh, interested in getting back into the Paris Accord uh, as soon as possible. Among the, uh, the messages of support that the president-elect has received since being uh, named on uh, Saturday, uh, he's heard from Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, in a message before the conversation. And uh, after a bit of a delay, he heard from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday, he even uh, received a congratulatory message from Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. On the, uh, the other side of the ledger, leaders who uh, have not yet contacted the president-elect, uh, perhaps because they don't want to get crossways with uh, 
uh, President Trump while he's still in office. Uh, President Xi Jinping of China uh, has uh, uh, avoided uh, getting in, in the crosshairs of the, uh, uh, any contentious issues between the president-elect and, and uh, President Trump. Mexican President Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador uh, has not yet uh, contacted the president-elect. Uh, he's uh, been known for carefully avoiding uh, getting crossways with, uh, with President Trump. And uh, he has his own uh, history of uh, challenging election results to, uh, to consider. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has declined to congratulate Biden as well. Uh, and he, uh, the, the Kremlin has made it known that they're concerned about the legal challenges to the election. And uh, uh, Russian media has continued to seize on the notion of our democratic process being in chaos. Uh, two other uh, uh, leaders with uh, ties to uh, uh, Trump were initially silent. Uh, President of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan uh, did not uh, send any note until uh, Tuesday when uh, he did congratulate the president-elect. And Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro uh, has uh, been silent uh, so far. From the Middle East, the uh, president of Egypt, uh, Sisi, has congratulated the president-elect. And Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, uh, sent uh, a note as well. Um, so that's uh, the lineup of uh, world leaders who have contacted the vice president and uh, some of the uh, levels of support or uh, ignoring uh, the developments uh, in, in some cases. Uh, gentlemen, it's uh, an interesting time watching the, the uh, prospective administration moving into position uh, internationally. You know, in, in the campaign, we didn't have very much conversation about uh, foreign affairs, even the um, October 22nd Belmont debate, there was national security on the agenda, but uh, it quickly turned to throwing mud back and forth about uh, banking, uh, bank accounts in China and um, family members who benefited from this or that deal. So I don't think we had a good uh, shakeout of foreign affairs in the campaign. Hopefully we'll hear more about uh, President Biden's approach to international issues in the coming weeks as he prepares to take office. Hey, Pat, I have a question for you. We have a little bit of time, if you don't mind. I mean, obviously it's an unusual time with uh, President Trump, not only not uh, uh, conceding the election result at this point, but actually alleging fraud and so forth. And uh, you passed along to me uh, and Tim too as well, I think, uh, a script of a interview that uh, Fox News' Brett Baer had with uh, Mike Pompeo uh, any comment uh, on that interview? Any reaction from you on that interview with uh, Secretary of State Pompeo? Well, uh, I saw earlier in the day from the State Department, Secretary Pompeo was at the podium and he was asked about the uh, whether or not the State Department uh, was uh, supporting the transition of Biden and whether that would impact uh, the, uh, the next administration. And he, uh, he had about a paragraph of uh, commentary on it, but he opened up by saying that the State Department uh, would be ready for the second Trump administration, which um, it, it, it appeared to be uh, joking at the time, uh, but it, you know, then, then he, he kind of cleaned it up a little bit in the Brett Baer interview. Uh, he didn't come right out and say, no, he was, you know, that was just uh, kidding around. Uh, he did say that the State Department would be ready, uh, that we were that uh, the Trump administration was still in office and the State Department was carrying out the uh, policies of the president and so forth. But it, it was uh, an uncomfortable moment with many who saw the Secretary of State at the podium in, in the State Department in Foggy Bottoms uh, sending a signal uh, around the world that, you know, there's, we haven't quite got our house in order yet. Because traditionally when, a, when there's a president-elect uh, there's a more warm opening uh, in places like the State Department. The General Services Administration uh, chief has yet to uh, release the funds and uh, security access uh, ability and uh, office space, et cetera, to the incoming Biden administration. So there's, uh, there's some, some sensitivities there. Uh, in the case of the State Department, the lack of uh, support of the, the new Biden 
administration means that he's talking with these leaders and it's a natural thing that the, you know, he's gonna be contacted by uh, allies uh, and even some uh, other countries uh, to have preliminary uh, conversations. And I think it would be helpful if he had the ability to talk to, to State Department uh, experts about what's the relationship, what are the issues with this or that country, things that he should know that uh, you know, are not in, in public view that uh, might be important when having these conversations. So there's, uh, there's concern that um, dragging out this transition um, embargo uh, could, uh, could be damaging to national security. And people have made reference to the 9-11 Commission report, which uh, uh, was pretty clear that the, the holdup in the transition of the George uh, Bush administration in uh, 2001, after the uh, delayed results from the Florida uh, vote count uh, was a factor in the administration not being fully up to speed and prepared to handle um, what's going on in the world when they took office in January 2001. You know, the, the rest of the world did not hit pause when the United States uh, had a had, uh, presidential campaign. So there are still things going on in, in 70 days. Um, Joe Biden is gonna be president and he'll have an administration that has to deal with uh, some pretty challenging situations. I would just chime in here and say that uh, I do agree and believe that uh, Joe Biden is gonna be our next president. Uh, I think back to 1976 when Jimmy Carter ran against Gerald Ford and uh, Jimmy Carter won Ohio by, like 8,000 votes. It was 2 million and 10,000 to 2 million and 2,000. And in Mississippi, uh, Carter won there by about 7,000 votes. It was maybe 150,000 to 143,000 for Ford. So it was a very close election. I don't know what occurred or how long it took them to sort that out. I think, as you noted, in the election where Gore uh, lost. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of controversy and that got strung out and we could debate that uh, on another day. And you point out that it did impact the transition uh, for um, Bush. Um, I think that, uh, that, that Trump believes that uh, you've got several states where it's very close within 10,000 votes or so that while he's behind by 5 million votes, he still thinks, I believe he thinks that uh, with the recount, which they announced earlier today that they're gonna do in Georgia, um, those types of things, you know, there's maybe, he thinks maybe a 25% chance he could win. Now, I don't think that should impact his sharing of information and allowing uh, Joe Biden's team to work with the State Department. I don't think that should do that, but I, I do think he believes he's going to win, and um, and just is is. I do believe he'll step down, and there'll be a smooth transition once it becomes apparent that Joe has won. But I don't think he believes yet that Joe has won. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll, I'll look forward to having the closure on this whole vote counting and recounting, et cetera, electoral college uh, business in the rear view mirror. Uh, but I'm, I'm concerned to some extent that uh, we give the new administration the best leg up to, to deal with what's going on. Because even though there wasn't much conversation in the campaign, uh, we've got uh, some heck of a lot of uh, issues. And, and I think the Biden administration is going to be consumed initially with COVID-19 and, and uh, the economy and the ability to deal with uh, what's going on in the world. He's going to have to put together a strong team that's ready to go on day one. Breck, anything else to say? And we'll, we'll uh, slide into uh, Bolivia, something less contentious than uh, Georgia, <laughs> uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, Arizona. Well, um, let's uh, let's jump into uh, talking about Bolivia, and uh, Tim uh, is with us today to talk about uh, the, the tumultuous presidency uh, 
uh, there and uh, what's been happening. Tim, the, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Pat. And thanks for having me as a guest on today's run of show. Uh, uh, it is interesting what's happening there and even comparing it to what's happening here. But uh, I want to take just a little time to talk about the current state of affairs of the presidency in Bolivia. Uh, the ex-president, Evo Morales, has just come back to the country this past Monday, two days ago. And he's come back to a triumphant homecoming, which raises questions and concern about uh, the political future there. Morales will be the president of the MAS MAS party, which stands for Movement for Socialism. While his former political ally, Luis Acre, serves as president of the country. Both men are avowed socialists, but only one of them can be president. And so they're in a little bit of a state of flux there. Um, so let, let me provide a little background. Uh, Evo Morales uh, ran for president in 2002, and he finished second. Uh, but between 2002 and 2005, there was internal conflict, economic stress, a couple of other interim presidents, and he became president in 2005, winning over 50% of the vote. He was then, and he remains very popular, to some extent because he gave more power to the indigenous majority. Uh, the company, or sorry, the country adopted a new constitution in 2009 and Morales won another term later that year and his party, the MAS party, won two thirds majority in Congress. So they swept the elections in 2009 and uh, the that while the constitution allows the president in Bolivia only two terms, he was allowed a third term in 2014 because the Supreme Court there ruled that his first term did not count since it was, uh, they overruled the constitution um, and just said that the first term was under the prior constitution. So his first term 2005 to 2009 was under the prior constitution. They did not count that. And then in 2019, through a series of political moves, the Supreme Court overruled the constitution. They scrapped term limits and they allowed Morales to run for a fourth term. And in 2019, in the election, uh, while it appeared as though he was winning the election, um, there were allegations that he rigged the vote, he was forced to resign, and the vote count and the process, they were heavily scrutinized. Most people felt the count was not accurate. So he was forced to leave the country. He was granted asylum in Mexico. And Janine Anez was declared acting president of Bolivia. However, the MAS party retained a majority in Congress. New elections were called for this past May, but due to COVID, the election was put off and it was finally held about three, four weeks ago, October 18th. In the new elections, there was record turnout, 90% of the people voted almost, and the MAS party received 55% of the votes, and Morales was, uh, actually, he had gotten asylum in Mexico. He was, at this point, he's in Argentina, and the winner of the election was Luis Acre. He was elected the new president of Bolivia on October 18th. Now, Acre is considered a left-wing economist, and he plans to restore relations with Cuba and Venezuela, uh, but he faces many problems. Uh, Bolivia has the fifth highest COVID death rate in the world. Their GDP is forecast to drop more than 10% this year, and unemployment 
is as high as 30% in many key industries such as construction. And uh, worst of all, Bolivia is the second poorest country in South America. Luis Acre is, seems to be hedging his bets as president by saying that he wants to be a good neighbor to Brazil and its far right president, Bolsonaro. Uh, but Evo Morales seems to be the heart and soul of the MAS party and the country. Upon arriving, arriving back in the country on Monday, he's making his way across and has a large entourage, a lot of support. So all of this is going to play out his role, his relationship with the new president, and the politics is going to be interesting to watch as events unfold over the next few weeks and months. What makes it so difficult to forecast is the history of Bolivia, which isn't too dissimilar from the history of the rest of the South American and Central American countries generally. And if you trace the political history of Bolivia, there have been coups, counter coups, caretaker governments, military governments, and coalitions built by presidents who achieved less than 25% of the popular vote, all governments which have been inherently unstable. Bolivia is only a country of only about 11 million people. It's about one and a half, 1.6 times the size of Texas. And it's located in the center of South America near the West Coast. It was part of the Incan Empire and the Spanish language is spoken along with perhaps 35 indigenous dialects. Um, the, and that's part of the attraction to Evo Morales. He's one of the indigenous. Um, the country was formed in 1825, named for Venezuela's Simon Bolivar. And over time, it's lost territory to Chile on the coast and to Paraguay on the internal part of the continent. And in the mix of all the governments, again, as you might expect in South America, guess what? The United States, we engineered a coup there in 1971, replaced the socialist government with a military dictatorship. And the president who was installed, he was ousted in 1978, so forth and so on. But he, Hugo Suarez came back in 1997 to rule as president until 2001. So all that is to say that it sounds like we're in for a repeat of history. It, it's hard to rule out a new government to replace a recently elected Luis Sacre. And it's hard to know what role the former three-time president Evo Morales will play. And if he'll step in and become president for a fourth time. And while the election results of 2019 were uncertain and felt many people felt rigged, most people believe that Morales did win a majority of the vote, which would have made him president for the fourth time. The real question was whether or not he had won by more than 10%, which would have been a requirement had he not uh, to have a runoff. So, it looks like we're in for a socialist government in Bolivia for some time with either Luis Acre or Eva Morales, but with the economic, political, and human disaster we've been having and have currently in Venezuela and with Bolivia likely to continue following these policies, all bets are off. And this is going on right now as we sit here today and will be interesting to watch between now and the end of the year. So um, that's a current update on what's happening there and it's changing daily. And it'll be interesting to see the dynamics between Evo Morales, who's heading the party and the new president. So any questions there or any thoughts, comments? You're on, you're on mute, mute, Pat. This, this is a, a, a interesting development. I, I think the United States has had an up and down relationship with Bolivia. And our, our primary concern probably is the, uh, the drug trade. Um, obviously Bolivia is a major source of, uh, of cocaine. 
and it seems to be out of the news uh, for much of the, re the recent past, but uh, I know we've had um, spotty relations with, with the government there, especially after Evo Morales took office a couple of years ago. Tim, what, what's your thought on, on the relationship with the United States? It, is, is it likely to remain rocky or uh, I know uh, Evo Morales and, and his uh, relations with Cuba and Venezuela have uh, put a strain on, on the relationship? Yeah, you know, Pat, I, I think so. I think it will remain rocky principally because of the socialist government and their policies and uh, their lack of uh, uh, coming down on uh, the coca producers. Um, and uh, I think the, the drug trade is, is, a, is a problem. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know Joe Biden's uh, uh, position on, on all of that, but it's, it's not, you know, one of your top tier countries. It's, the relationship is less important, for example, than that with Brazil. Um, but, you know, with Trump, he seems to have taken a standoff approach to, to most everything. Uh, but I, uh, I, I do uh, struggle to understand uh, why uh, these countries are constantly uh, ruled or, or run by, by the socialists. I think it sounds good, but I believe in the capitalistic system and that it provides the best way of life. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way for them to lift themselves up from being the second poorest country would be to, to institute uh, uh, more capitalist policies, but. Uh, I, I suspect uh, a lot of um, Morales's uh, electoral success is connected to his uh, being from among the indigenous population who may see that the, uh, the ruling merchant class in the, in the past uh, has not been uh, very helpful to their situation. As you mentioned, uh, Bolivia does suffer from extreme levels of poverty and, and uh, that may, uh, you know, we, we saw in Venezuela that um, the, uh, the champions of socialism there uh, have been, have ridden on the shoulders of, of the underclass in terms of, uh, of winning votes. So it, it may be a, a democratic reflection on on uh, the conditions of the population. Well, that's true. And I think a lot, and, and in the past there have been revolutions there that have been instigated by, you know, the poor treatment of the workers. Uh, it has a big mining uh, uh, business, mining silver and uh, other minerals, and uh, they've not treated those people well. Um, and, and as I say, that's caused revolutions in the past. And like you say, there are something like 35 languages spoken there. So it's a very, it's a hodgepodge of different peoples. And um, so it's a, it's a tough, tough situation. So. Well, I, I think the, uh, the fact that the U.S. relations with Bolivia and the United States was a major contributor of aid until uh, Morales won his first term, and I suspect that uh, things have not gotten better for the uh, Bolivian population with the withdrawal of uh, American aid. Um, we'll see with a new administration whether we can uh, find a, a common cause there. Greg, any uh, observations or you're, you're anxious to get on to your, uh, your topic? Um, uh, we can stay on Bolivia or I'm happy to move on, whatever, uh, whatever you think. Any of your thoughts on socialism in South America? Well, I was going to ask him more about uh, the uh, root uh, reasons for the support of Morales and the Moss Party, but I think we've covered that and uh, and good points all the way around. All right. All right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Tim. Uh, great uh, presentation. I, I think that's the situation we'll we'll have to follow uh, more closely. It it, uh, it does seem to be. Uh, potential source of instability in, in an important area. Dr. Breck Walker, um, Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, troubles. We've seen the report on nothing but trouble. 
<laughs> well, Pat and, uh, Pat and Tim, we've had some concerning things going on in Ethiopia uh, over the past week. And, and maybe Pat and I have a perhaps a particular interest in developments there because we both have, vi have visited the country at different points in time. Pat, I believe you as a Navy man were there back in the 70s at a military ceremony where the former emperor, Haile Selassie, was present. And uh, three years ago, uh, I was down in the Omo River Valley in southwestern Ethiopia uh, uh, exploring. Uh, so uh, we have a particular interest in what's going on there. Um, Ethiopia is the second most popular, uh, most populous country in Africa after Nigeria. The population in Ethiopia is about 115 million, and almost half that population uh, is under the age of 15. Ethiopia is also one of the oldest nations in the world. It dates back, according to some accounts, to 980 BC. Back in those days, it was called Abyssinia, and Ethiopia is mentioned both in the Bible and in the Quran, uh, interestingly. And even way before that, uh, the oldest fossilized, uh, fossilized skeleton of a human or a human ancestor, in any event, was found in this country, and that skeleton is thought to be uh, something a little bit more than three million years uh, old. Ethiopia is the only African nation never to have been formally colonized. It suffered through two Italian invasions, but in both instances, Italian forces were defeated and Ethiopia maintained uh, its independence. And then just as a fun fact, uh, many people say that coffee was first discovered in Ethiopia in its Kaffa region, K-A-F-F-A, -F -F in its Kaffa region. And that in fact is where the name coffee uh, comes from. And then probably, as most of us know, Ethiopia is very much one of the poorest countries in the world. The last statistic uh, I saw was that it was the fifth uh, poorest uh, country in the world. So uh, with that as quick uh, background, the, uh, the central government of Ethiopia and the northern state of Tigray are at odds with one another. And those tensions have now escalated into a military conflict. And just quick, a quick little history. Uh, after throwing a communist junta out in 1991, the Ethiopian government has been structured as a parliamentary democracy, or I guess I would call it a, a, a quasi-democracy. And because of ethnic divisions, uh, there are over 80 languages spoken uh, in Ethiopia. Because of ethnic divisions, uh, the constitution gives considerable political power to the 10 Ethiopian states that are, uh, for the most part, ethnically divided. And uh, over the last uh, 30 years, it's had pretty much a weak central government. Uh, but for the last two and a half decades, political power in Ethiopia has rested for the most part with the Tigrayans. They're an ethnic group representing only 6% of the population and they're centered in the state of Tigray in Northern Ethiopia. And they've run things for the last 25 years uh, up until 2018 and then their corruption and overreaching in the government did cause a popular and electoral backlash. And in 2018, uh, Abiy Hamed was elected prime minister. And he's from the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, uh, the Oromos, uh, the which represent about a third of the population. Now, Abiy is a progressive, although it's too early to tell if he's a committed Democrat, I think. His first two years in office as prime minister, though, were extremely noteworthy. He is today the youngest African leader at age 44, and he draws a lot of media attention because of that. He introduced in his first two years uh, a large number of democratic reforms, including the release of a lot of political prisoners. He's tried to bring marginalized Ethiopian eth ethnic groups into the political process. He signed, uh, he forged a peace treaty uh, with Eritrea after many years of sort of a stalemated Cold War had gone on between those two countries. And he's generally been an active force for peace in East Africa. And for that, he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. But as part of his time as prime minister, he's also been trying to take power away from the uh, individual states and consolidate it in the central government. And he's arguing that that will make Ethiopia a more modern and a more stable uh, nation. And in particular, he set his sights on reducing the political influence of the Tigrayans, pushing them out of the central government and reducing the powers of their state government. And the Tigrayans have pushed back 
They charge that Abi is a dictator in disguise, that he's violating the Ethiopian constitution by reducing the power of the state governments. And tensions between the two groups have been rising for several months. And essentially, uh, I guess you could call this a, content, a contest of sorts between the people who are now in power, uh, the Oromos, and the people who used to be in power, the Tigrayans. Now, recently, Tigray refused to accept a new military commander that the central government had appointed for the northern region. And uh, the, Tigrayan, the Tigrayan government in September defied Abiy's postponement of all elections. He postponed it because of the pandemic. And they went ahead and held their own state elections, despite uh, or to, uh, you know, sort of stick in, uh, put a stick in Abiy's eye, I guess. And then last week, allegedly, the Tigrayan militia attacked a military post with an intent to uh, steal weapons. Now, Abi has responded uh, in the last week by cutting off all communications into Tigray. He has ordered air attacks and sent in troops, and reports are that uh, hundreds have been killed. Abi says that he makes no bones about it. His intentions are to remove the uh, Tigrayan government leaders. He calls them traitors. They represent, he says, a danger to national security. He downplays the prospect of prolonged fightings and says all this will be over shortly. Uh, and the Tigrayan government will be deposed. However, Tigray may not be that easy a nut to crack. A significant number of the Ethiopian military are Tigrayan, and their loyalty remains uncertain uh, in a uh, military conflict. And there are also many, many Tigrayan veterans from the war with Eritrea back 20 years ago that make up formidable militias. Some people say that Tigray could field as many as 250,000 experienced soldiers, meaning that a civil war, if one broke out, uh, could be very bloody uh, indeed. Now, the prospect of civil war is sufficiently high that the United Nations, the African Union, and the United States have all sent diplomats to the region to try and convince a B to back off, to cease, hosti to cease hostilities uh, and negotiate. And so far, neither side seems to be interested in talking. And a B again says, this is all gonna be over uh, shortly. Now, uh, as Tim was talking about a little bit, the question becomes, why should we in the United States care about uh, these developments? And I think that there are five reasons that uh, we should be concerned and watching closely these developments. The first is a civil war, of course, would create a humanitarian crisis in an area where life is already precarious and famine, for example, is an ever-present possibility. Secondly, a civil war would also create a flow of refugees out of Ethiopia that might be destabilizing to Ethiopia's neighbors, such as the Sudan or Somalia or Kenya. Uh, and look at what happened to Europe when the refugee crisis uh, coming out of the Middle East uh, hit. It has created a huge number of political problems and argu arguably is changing the political context of many governments in Europe uh, because of popular outcry against the immigration that has resulted from these refugee flows. Thirdly, a civil war might develop into a wider war involving more people than Ethiopia with uncertain consequences. Eritrea has no love loss for the Tigrayans and might intervene on the side of a bee at some point, and who knows where that might lead. And then fourthly, an all-out civil war could turn Ethiopia into something like Somalia, perhaps, a failed state. And even if it's something short of that, where Ethiopia was partially dismembered, that runs the risk of creating a haven for extremist groups and terrorists and the like. And then lastly, Chaos draws bad characters in to manipulate the situation for their own benefit. And Russia and Turkey and China, among others, all have meaningful presences in the region. The Horn of Africa is a strategic area in a geopolitical sense, sitting astride trade routes and near major oil producing regions. So this is something that the United States needs to pay attention to. And, and it is something that uh, if Ethiopia were to break out into all out civil war, uh, the United States would not be good, in my mind at least, for United States uh, interest. So, Pat, I'll leave it at that, if that's okay. That's what's going on there. That's a terrific uh, summary, uh, Breck, of the uh, increasing tensions in that region, which is already uh, seeing a lot of strife in the neighborhood. Um, one wonders if we could see the birth of another nation. You know, there was the uh, the conflict between Eritrea and Ethiopia, and 
Eritrea, you mentioned my visit uh, to Ethiopia, and it was actually to the port city of Masawa, which uh, is now part of Eritrea. So I guess, does that mean I can't say I've been to Ethiopia? <laughs> we get two Whatever. answers for that. <laughs> Uh, and I should probably mention that uh, I was very young at the time, um, but uh, it, it is an area of uh, concern to the United States. We uh, we currently see Yemen in, uh, in, a, in a great deal of uh, turmoil just across the uh, the Babel Mendeb Straits in, in the Red Sea. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, we have our eye on the region. There's a U.S. presence in Djibouti, which is the tiny little French colony, former French colony, uh, hugging the coast of the Red Sea there up, up against Ethiopia and uh, Tigray and Eritrea. So, so this is a complicated uh, neighborhood. And as you say, it, you know, a problem in one country uh, can quickly move into another country. Uh, we've also talked here in the news review in, in recent weeks about the GERD, the great the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, which is uh, damming up the uh, headwaters of the Nile River, which uh, Egypt thinks is an existential threat to its existence. And if you've ever flown over Egypt, you see nothing but sand, and then you pass over the Nile uh, River, and on either side for about 10 miles, there's life and the rest of Egypt is uh, subject to arid conditions. So Ethiopia is in a contentious situation uh, already with, uh, with one neighbor and it could easily extend to others. So I, I think you've, you've laid out uh, a very important case of uh, a situation we need to keep our eyes on. It's, it's interesting uh, that uh, Abi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize is so quick to pull the trigger on using military might in dealing with this, you know, this rogue uh, province within the country, rather than, as uh, you suggested uh, in in your report, that uh, diplomatic efforts might be more fruitful. You know, the it's interesting. I'm I'm fascinated by this. We talked a little bit about it uh, last time, but uh, there are leaders that are uh, have been praised with Nobel Peace Prizes and otherwise for their progressiveness in uh, international affairs. Uh, but when it comes to, in their view, protecting the interest of the stability of their countries, they come under great criticism because they take a more uh, a violent approach. And uh, not only is uh, Abi an example, but so is, as we talked about, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi from uh, Myanmar. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, issue, I think, to uh, uh, see how people's opinions change, and she may be under some political pressure from the military, but to see how people's opinion changes as the threats to their country, as the threats they perceive uh, to their country as those threats change. Yeah, one wonders if um, uh, Barack Obama had not received the uh, Peace Prize so early in his administration, if uh, after the, uh, the drone wars, uh, he would have been uh, seen in the same, the same light. Uh, interesting times. Let me just, uh, if, if I could, uh, share a map of the region. Um, now we, we were talking about Ethiopia, uh, but uh, it's it's really the crossroads of uh, a critical area. Uh, Sudan to the, the northwest, Eritrea, the, the former part of Ethiopia on the Red Sea, which now makes uh, Ethiopia a landlocked country, uh, and, and squeezed in between that Djibouti uh, which uh, separates the uh, Horn of Africa from the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, Yemen is deeply involved in a civil war uh, being prosecuted by a coalition, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So that's a, a disastrous situation. Somalia is still uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, its status as a, a failed state. Uh, terrorism is a continuing concern that extends into Kenya, which is just south of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, so really this this area is not much discussed in the news, uh, but certainly of interest to uh, US interest as we look at, at uh, what's going on in that whole region. It's uh, central to so many potential conflicts. I, I did, um, did a quick look up after you said you were gonna talk about uh, Tigray, and it is a, an, an oil, um, a shale oil and mineral uh, rich uh, gold, copper, silver, et cetera. 
So I suspect Addis Ababa, um, Ethiopia, uh, they don't want to see Tigray break off and become another Eritrea. I'm sure that's right. Tim, any comments from you? I really don't have any. I, I don't. Uh, I don't. You know, I, 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 I'm interested to know more about Eritrea and that uh, truce that they reached. I know they were fighting for some time. You mentioned that the Eritreans might uh, go in and support the Ethiopians if it turned into a, a big war and, and, and fight against the Tigrians. But uh, I don't know the dynamics going on there. I think it's, you know, it, it, like so many parts of the world, you've got different tribes making up a country. And, you know, I'm not sure how those borders were drawn. And if tribes were split and the Tigrians, it's, it's very complicated. It's kind of like being from the South. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, I, I did have, you know, uh, a segue. I was going to um, uh, mention uh, one thing that I think is, is, is exciting and interesting and has an international spin to it. And, and that is uh, for our listeners, um, the Masters Golf Tournament is this weekend. And uh, the Augusta National Course opened up in 87 years ago, and it has a history of inviting international players from all over the world. Uh, you've got British Open champions, you've got Olympi Olympic gold medalists is invited, all the British Open, British amateurs are invited, Latin American amateur champion, Asia Pacific <laughs> champion. Um, you've got the winners from the British Open that are invited. Uh, the 50 leaders in the world golf rankings. And if you're a golfer, which I am, uh, this is sort of a trip to Mecca this weekend with, with Augusta National. With COVID, they moved uh, the date to this coming weekend. And I won't name and list all the international players that have won, but it is truly an international event. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Good point. Good point. Yeah, well, I, I don't think we uh, think much of, of uh, golf in the international context, other than occasionally there's a major tournament in uh, Scotland and, and uh, elsewhere overseas. But uh, that you, you raise a good point, Tim, about the international nature of, of that sport. Uh, well, you know, you, you've got just to throw out some names that have won the Masters: uh, Sergio Garcia. Uh, from Spain and Danny Willett from England recently, Adam Scott from Australia, Charles Schwartzel from South Africa, Angel, Angel Cabrera from Argentina, uh, Mike Weir from Canada, Gary Player obviously from South Africa. There's a long list. Of, and if you watch it, uh, there'll be a, a Japanese player and there'll be the, the, all of the Japanese press will su surround him. And, <laughs> <laughs> So it's, uh, it does, they, they make a strong effort to make it an international event. The selections committee has in fact at its discretion, the ability to invite international players not otherwise qualified. So anyway, Good stuff. I just thought I'd throw that out. Hey Pat, do you mind if I add one other thing for 30 seconds? You bet. The uh, one thing we didn't talk about today, but uh, maybe we'll talk about it next week, but I think it really bears watching is the president's uh, firing of the current Secretary of Defense, Esper. Uh, and certainly the Trump administration has done lots of unprecedented things, some good and probably some not so good. But uh, this seems to be relatively historic uh, because presumably it's late in Trump's term. Uh, uh, the, it, it has precipitated the resignations of some senior uh, Department of Defense people, uh, people that have gone into those slots. I think everybody recognized from CNN to Fox News that these are uh, people that lackeys may be too strong a term, but uh, devout supporters of the president and not necessarily qualified for those positions. And we mentioned national security in the very, very early going. But I think this is something that's very concerning. Uh, I think it's concerning to a lot of people on all sides of the political issue, and it bears watching. 
for sure. You, you raise a good point and uh, maybe we'll take that uh, up next week. And I think there could be uh, more complexity to that uh, whole story as the news is reporting that CIA Director Gina Haspel is, is among the potential targets for uh, being shown the door. And in the midst of a transition with, uh, you know, 10 weeks left before inauguration day uh, to see senior uh, officials, cabinet officials and other senior uh, officials in the defense department moved out and uh, loyalists moved in, it, it does uh, raise some concerns. So we'll take a look at that next week. Uh, good call, uh, Breck. Uh, I'll mention that uh, we've talked here in the news review about the situation between Azerbaijan and Armenia in Nagorno Karabakh. And it was reported uh, yesterday that there has been a truce. Uh, Russian peacekeepers are on the ground in Nagorno Karabakh, and our, uh, Azerbaijan has been given the territory that they uh, have taken in the recent conflict. So we'll uh, we'll we'll probably talk about the uh, situation there between Russia and Turkey, uh, because that's a potential uh, hotspot as well. So a lot going on in the world, uh, from Bolivia to the Horn of Africa to Nagorno Karabakh in the, the Caucasus. And we will try to uh, keep everybody up to date. Breck, let's uh, jump into our quiz question and uh, give everybody the uh, the answer here. The answer to uh, which Muslim group has uh, generated a lot of international focus because of a human rights crisis involving them? And the answer is I, uh, sorry, I, A. The answer is A, Rohingya uh, on that. And Pat, let me just say too that the next time Tim's on, uh, I would really like for him to bring his bagpipes uh, and maybe do <laughs> something on it. So I look forward to that. I don't think you want to hear that. Uh, <laughs> maybe well, maybe we you. maybe we can get him to read the quiz question and, and we'll give him some of those Romanian names to, to pronounce. <laughs> That'd be great. Pat, thanks for having me. Breck, thank you so much. Enjoyed it. It was great fun. Thanks. Jim, thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, spending the time to to uh, prepare to talk about uh, Bolivia and, and uh, be with us today. And thank you for your service to the board of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, we, we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, back on here uh, on the Global News Review. Um, right. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, thanks so see you next much. week. Thank you. Bye-bye.